Alright guys, welcome to what will hopefully be a fairly short, fairly straightforward lesson about how energy flows through ecosystems. And if you don't understand the cartoon, well, when we review these laws of thermodynamics, it will hopefully help. So there are two laws of thermodynamics that are relevant to us when we're looking at biology, and they can be phrased in many different ways. If you go into upper level physics, they'll tell you something different. We're going to go over this as the first law of thermodynamics is basically conservation of energy and matter. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. So because of this, organisms must use already existing energy to perform work and already existing molecules to build their biological macromolecules. So you can't just have a biological system out in the middle of nowhere with no energy source for it because, you know, you can't create energy. Okay, so that's one limitation for organisms. They have to get their energy from somewhere. Another limitation deals with the second law of thermodynamics, which will be phrased in many different ways. We're going to look at it as, over time, entropy, or disorder, increases. What does this mean? Well, whenever you're doing an energy transformation, which you have to do because of the first law of thermodynamics, you can't create it or destroy it, only transform it from one form to another, um, unfortunately, some of that energy will always be converted to low quality heat energy that is not available to an organism to do work. So while you cannot destroy energy, you can have energy be lost to an ecosystem because the ecosystem, the organisms in it are no longer able to take that energy and use it to do work. It's still there. It still exists, but it's low quality energy. It is not going to help us uh, build a molecule. Um, to move, to meow at our humans while they're recording a lecture video, none of that. So let's take a look about, let's take a look at entropy. So if you have these molecules in these two different or organizations, which one of these do you think represents an earlier time and which one do you think represents a later time? Well, the earlier time would be the more ordered system. So the more ordered the system, eh, the, the earlier in the, you know, the start of you looking at the system, it probably occurred. Disorder tends to increase, which is why something like diffusion tends to happen. So this is actually, you know, looking at like almost a classic case of diffusion. Uh, you're going to have these molecules. They are trapped in one corner. We release the system, let it move as it wants, and then these molecules will diffuse and spread out. Um, similarly, you can look at entropy and disorder. Uh, if you're looking at, for example, a pile of bricks, if you take a pile of bricks and uh, bricks and you just randomly toss them off of a truck, which pile is more likely to be produced? Well, the more disordered pile. What does this mean for organisms? Well, um, so organisms store energy in the form of chemical energy like glucose. And then when they convert that energy to uh, you know, the form of ATP where they can do work, they basically are creating a more disordered system. Honestly, if you left a living creature, um, you stopped all enzymatic reactions, you didn't let any other organisms nearby, and you just let that system sit, eventually all the complex molecules would break down to simpler ones, more disordered ones. Um, they have more stability as well. To store up that energy in the form of glucose, you've got to take energy from some source. You've got to use it to counteract entropy and make a more ordered system. Uh, there's all these conversations like philosophical and otherwise about how life is like little bits of order, little pockets of order in the increasing entropy of our universe, which is, you know, kind of true. Then you can also store potential energy, as we talked about in unit three, in the form of proton gradients. So you can build up a gradient with any ion, quite frankly. This would be a ordered system. It's got stored potential energy, just like that glucose molecule had stored potential energy. When you allow this system to just naturally flow, you're going to have these hydrogen ions flowing down their concentration gradient through this channel protein. You are going to reach a state of increased disorder because they're not going to be organized on one side of the membrane. And that is going to cause this system to have less potential energy. So this part has less energy. This part has more energy. 
So organisms have found really clever ways to use up that energy that's stored in various, you know, ordered systems and use it to do work. My apologies. This is the time of afternoon when the kitten wants to play fetch and she is mad that I am not. So what does this mean for organisms? Well, if you remember back to freshman ecology in, in bio, um, you probably learned about the 90-10 rule. Uh, the fact that at each trophic level, at each level where an organism eats in an ecosystem, you're going to lose some of that energy as heat. So only about 10% of the energy in an ecosystem is available to be passed on to the next trophic level. So your usable energy, not energy, because remember, you can't destroy energy, but the energy that's usable for you decreases as it's passed to the next trophic level. So organisms take in a certain amount of energy uh, from the sun. Those would be your primary producers. Let's say they have this much energy. So they have 20,810 kilocals per meter squared per year. We're going to forget about the units for now. Out of all that, only 3,368 gets passed on to primary consumers. They will use some of that energy. A lot of it will be used for respiration, loss to heat, um, and used to perform tasks. And then out of that, what's left about, let's say almost three quarters of it goes to decomposers and about 383 uh, kilocals of energy are gonna move on to the next trophic level. Um, and then you'll see that the next trophic level gets even less. So one thing I wanna point out is that it's not exactly 10% of the energy that get, gets passed on at each trophic level. Um, that's just an approximation and average, but you may have free response questions or other questions where you have to calculate the amount of energy lost. And what you would do is remember when you're calculating any percentage, it's gonna be a part over a whole times 100%. So if you wanted to calculate how much energy, uh, what the energy efficiency or what the transfer efficiency was between secondary and tertiary consumers, you'd say, okay, well, that's gonna equal 21 over 383, because that's how much they had at the beginning times 100%. And I'm not gonna take the time to divide that out. You can break out your calculator and do that yourself if you'd like. Um, this also means that it's more efficient to eat lower on the food chain uh, because you're getting more energy out of the ecosystem. You're not waiting until a lot of it's been lost uh, as heat or used for different you know, other tasks in the body um, and is not available to you to eat as a consumer. This also limits the number of trophic levels in an ecosystem. Uh, in a natural ecosystem, it is rare to find something eating above a tertiary consumer. Um, if you have a quaternary consumer, most of them usually eat from multiple levels of the food chain because, chain because there's just not enough energy to support those organisms at a higher trophic level. So this is a, a nice little diagram that I like that shows you how energy and how materials cycle through an ecosystem. So notice you've got energy coming into this ecosystem from sunlight. It's going to go into the primary producers. They're going to send it to primary consumers. We're going to send it to secondary and tertiary consumers. Along the way, some of this energy is being lost as heat at every stage. And then whatever energy is left gets passed on to basically detritivores, which are those organisms that eat dead stuff. They're going to let off their own little bits of uh, energy lost as heat. Um, and then they're going to use some of it. Some of them get eaten by other consumers as well. Um, and the notice that while energy flows, matter cycles. Matter is recycled over and over, which is a good thing because otherwise we'd soon run out of carbon atoms to use. But energy does not cycle. Energy is going through the system in one direction, comes into the system, leaves the system as heat that is not usable. But matter, once it's in the system, stays in the system. All right. Organisms take in energy. 
What do they use it for? All organisms require an input of energy. It has to be constant. If you stop getting energy, and if you don't have enough stored energy in your body, you die. Um, there are all these different purposes we use it for. We use it to maintain our systems, maintain homeostasis, because remember, we're these little islands of, of order in the larger ocean of disorder that is the universe, and we've got to maintain homeostasis and keep our internal conditions stable and different from the external conditions. So we maintain our organization. Uh, if we are growing, either growing from like a smaller form to a larger form, or um, you know, just adding fat cells, uh, like so many of us have done during the pandemic, and use also energy to reproduce. Now, if you look at everything through the lens of evolution, you'll see that a lot of the adaptations organisms have are to get energy in a particular ecosystem and um, use it as efficiently as possible. So there are multiple ways that organisms make sure that they are going to use their energy um, efficiently or for certain purposes. So there are two major life strategies that we'll talk about. They're endotherms and ectotherms, otherwise known as warm-blooded and cold-blooded. Um, not technically, you know, the truest phrases, but it's stuck. Um, endotherms have their own system for regulating their body temperature. So if you look at this, temp this graph right here, it shows you the ambient temperature. That means the surrounding temperature, like I have defined here. Um, and this shows you the body temperature. So notice for this endotherm, which is a bobcat, its body temperature is pretty constant no matter the outside temperature. Doesn't matter if it's zero degrees, well, maybe five degrees outside to 40 degrees outside, that bobcat is able to maintain a stable internal body temperature of just a smidge under 40 degrees Celsius. On the other hand, an ectotherm like this snake, which does not maintain its, its uh, body temperature at a surrounding level, I mean, at a certain level, its body temperature varies directly with the temperature outside. Uh, if it's warm outside, the snake will be warm. If it's cold outside, the snake will be cold. So they're, they don't, put extra effort into maintaining a body temperature. Um, if you look at energy use, organisms that are endotherms, we basically burn energy. We, I mean, burn like fuel, burn glucose to produce heat to maintain our body temperature. And we actively do that, which takes a lot of energy. So organisms that are endotherms, they have some advantages. They can survive in a larger range of environmental conditions. It's really difficult for a reptile if it gets super cold um, because it, it can't produce extra warmth to help uh, keep itself at a temperature where its, its body reactions can, can be maintained. Whereas, you know, a, a mammal or something else that's an endotherm can. If you think about it, there are polar bears in, in the desert, or not desert, polar bears in uh, the far north where it's super cold, you don't see a lot of lizards up there. Ectotherms have a body temperature that matches the ambient temperature. Now, they don't necessarily just deal with what the temperature is. They have some behavioral adaptations that can help them maintain warmth. So, uh, for example, they can move from the sun to the shade or back. So if it's super hot, they can move into the shade to reduce their temperature. If it's very uh, cold, they may sun themselves to absorb a little extra heat energy. They may aggregate with other individuals, by which I mean basically form a dog pile or in this case, maybe a snake pile. Um, and so the organisms will kind of bunch up together and share body heat. This, by the way, is just, I think, a really great way to illustrate this. This is a thermal image of a person who's holding, wrapped around their arm, a snake. So people, uh, humans, are endotherms. We maintain a constant body temperature. You no, know, because you've had to measure it to check if you have a fever. Um, whereas if you note this snake, its body temperature is basically matching the temperature of the environment. It's not much warmer than the environment. Now, this snake was probably just picked up by this person because over time, what will happen is the snake will start to absorb some heat from the person. The person won't change body temperature, but the snake probably will. Like um, if any of you guys have met Miss Scrudato snake, um, her snake likes me. That's because I'm warm, not because I'm a, a great snake conversationalist. So um, with this, you know, energy is available in differing amounts at different times. 
Uh, and so organisms ha have tailored their reproductive strategies to maximize energy availability. So for example, a lot of organisms out there, especially a lot of animals, have seasonal reproduction. So they will mate during specific times of the year, usually when there's good temperature, when there's plenty of food and water available, um, when there is no predator presence or low predator presence, and then when the young are born, they'll, have, uh, they'll be born at a time when their survival chances will increase. That's why you don't see a lot of organisms giving birth in, say, the dead of winter. Um, so uh, female seasonal breeders will usually have one or, or more, just a few estrous cycles, which is when they release an egg and uh, it's able to be fertilized when they're quote in season. Um, and then males who are seasonal breeders will have changes in testosterone levels, uh, changes in their testes, as well as their fertility levels. Uh, they also may become more aggressive during that time in species where um, the males will fight for dominance over the right to, to reproduce. If you've seen videos of like deer or sheep or goats or anything like locking horns and like basically fighting each other, it's usually during mating season. Plants also reproduce seasonally, which you will know if you notice when there are seeds available, because those are plant babies, and when there are flowers available or flowers blooming, because those are plant reproductive organs. So, um, the, the actual production of the seeds and germination of the seeds don't necessarily occur at the same time. So once plants um, start detecting changes in light uh, that are associated with spring and they start sprouting all their new leaves and everything, once they've stored enough energy from photosynthesis, they'll use that energy to flower and then produce fruits and or seeds. Now, pollination will tend to be linked to the time when their pollinators are seasonally active because uh, you can have all the flowers you want. If you rely on a pollinator to help transfer your pollen to another plant and the pollinator's not there, you're, you're not going to reproduce. Um, seed germination is very heavily tied to environmental conditions, especially in you know ecosystems where you're, you're really, really waiting for that one good resource. So in deserts, a lot of seeds, they may have been... The seeds may have been shed a long time ago, but once a rainfall hits, bam, the, all of those plants will just sprout all at once quickly to use up the rainfall as much as possible. Um, and then, you know, maybe seed before dying or maybe, you know, outcompete each other. In Chaparral, which is an ecosystem which is very prone to wildfires, they tend to have seasonal wildfires. Um, some plants have adapted to this in that their seeds will only germinate after they're exposed to intense heat or smoke or other conditions of a wildfire. In areas with harsh winters, you may have to um, have your uh, plants need to be exposed to extended cold uh, in order to be able to germinate. If you've ever tried to grow plants in a garden, um, some bulbs, for example, need to be exposed to cold before they can germinate. So like I've had some tulips before, I forgot to leave them outside. They were inside my house where it's temperature regulated. And uh, once I planted them, those things never bloomed. That's why you don't trust me with plants. Um, and then there's also, you know, other times when resources are lean. And so you may not want to have that time uh, to reproduce because if there's not enough water, if temperatures are extreme, if there's not food and you reproduce, your babies are going to die. And you've used a lot of energy to produce those babies. Um, and then, you know, to not have them live to pass on your genes is really, really unfit. So some organisms can go through a stage called reproductive diapause, literally pausing their life cycle, and they can do this to delay their um, reproduction. So here we see, I believe this is C. elegans, a type of worm, and it is heavily used in research. Well, if it is either uh, exposed to conditions like limited food, uh, very dense population or high temperatures, it can enter this kind of reproductive diapause and then it can stay in that phase until it, it receives proper living conditions so that it can be able to reproduce, after which it will reproduce. Um, biennial plants are an interesting strategy. So some plants are annuals. They live for one year, um, they put out seeds and then they die. Uh, there are perennials, which live for year after year, like think trees, and then there are biennials, which are a little bit in between. So what they do is they'll grow for a year. So that's like here, here's seed. They'll grow for a year. They will live through a winter when they'll lie dormant. They'll grow again. 
they'll flower and then they'll die after they've produced their seeds. So these guys live for two years. Um, there are some advantages of this. Uh, so if we look at the life cycle of this plant up here, this is a carrot. So carrots are biennials. They'll germinate, they'll grow, and they will build up nutrients in this thick taproot, which is the carrot that we eat. Usually around this time, when it's fattest, is when you'd harvest it. Uh, if you let that carrot stick around, though, the plant in the ground, what'll happen is after a winter when it'll grow dormant, uh, it won't look like the there's much plant alive there, then uh, what'll happen is it'll grow and it'll very rapidly flower, produce seeds, and then die. So there are a couple of advantages to this. So uh, when you have this long growth period, you can store a lot of energy. And then once you do end up flowering the second year, you can make these really large, really complex flower structures. Um, another thing these biennials can do is produce uh, a basically like ton of seeds at one time. So that way, hopefully there's a chance that a lot of them, uh, some of them will survive to um, sprout in another area. Uh, their low growth rate during their initial phase means that they are able to survive being grazed frequently. So if there are herbivores around that would eat them, it's not a big deal. It's not like they've lost their reproductive structures. And then they can also develop large roots to store water and energy so they can survive during the winter. So some of these um, vegetables that we grow that are tap roots like carrots and I think maybe turnips, if I remember correctly, uh, those are biennial plants. Um, another thing, smaller organisms tend to have a higher metabolic rate. So if we look at this, um, this is on this graph, we have our mass of individual organisms. And then over here, we have our metabolic rate. And I just wanted to point out how it's measured. It's the volume, so millimeters, cubic millimeters of oxygen used per gram of body mass every hour. So basically what they could do is they could take a, this mouse, which looks more like a rabbit than a mouse, I did not make this diagram. They could take it, put it in a chamber, measure how much oxygen it's using every hour, take its mass, and then figure out, you know, for every gram of body mass it has, how much oxygen is it using. And that is linked to the metabolic rate because, you know, you use your oxygen for cellular respiration. More oxygen you use, the more cellular respiration you have going on. So it's an indirect measure of your metabolism. Well, Smaller organisms tend to have higher metabolic rates. Um, they also uh, tend to live less time. Uh, so for example, mice don't live as long, but elephants can live for decades. Humans can live for decades, etc. cetera. Um, and we also tend to have lower metabolic rates. So when you have changes in the amount of energy available to an organism, then that can cause changes. So for example, here we have uh, this slightly freaky looking brown bear, uh, it has had a net loss of energy, which means that it's basically going to lose mass. You start losing tissue, losing cells, or your cells get smaller um, as you break down their materials to provide yourself with energy. If that happens long enough and you are no longer able to um, provide energy to run your cells, then uh, that can cause death. A net gain in energy causes energy storage or growth. Energy storage could be in the form of a plant storing energy in its roots, or it could be in the form of a person uh, gaining fat weight. Changes in energy availability can affect populations and ecosystems as well. So just a reminder, there are lots of ecological pyramids. Um, they're going to compare depending on which type of ecological pyramid you're looking at, different factors at different trophic levels. The base of each of these pyramids is going to represent uh, the level of producers, uh, the ones who are going to first make organic material in an ecosystem, and then you add the other trophic levels on top. Hopefully terms like primary consumer, secondary consumer, and tertiary consumer are not too unfamiliar. So there are made many different types of pyramids. We're going to look at three examples, pyramid of numbers, a pyramid of biomass, and a pyramid of energy. So pyramid of numbers tells you how many individuals uh, of a particular species are in that ecosystem. So we'll see like the traditional sort of um, pyramid shape when we look at a, a grassland because it's got like you know, millions of little individual plant organisms, and then many of these other uh, primary and secondary and tertiary consumers. If you look at something like a forest, though, uh, it looks, it might look very different. It may look a little top heavy, and that's because 
Um, if you're talking about a forest, a lot of the producers, there are trees. Well, one tree can support a lot of primary producers. Um, and so the number of organisms you have may look very tiny. But then if you did what was actually um, a biomass pyramid or an energy pyramid, you would see something more like the traditional view. So biomass pyramid looks at biomass. Biomass is the dry weight of an organism. So if you sucked all the water out of something, how much would be the weight of what's left? And it's kind of representative of the amount of energy that's left. All right, so we have here what looks like an inverted pyramid. This is in the English Channel. The biomass of the producers in this ecosystem is, is pretty small. It's algae, but they reproduce so quickly that they're able to survive to um, to provide for and support a large number of primary consumers. Uh, in other ecosystems, you might see a more typical pyramid shape. Uh, and then a pyramid of energy will usually look very similar to a pyramid of biomass, since you can use biomass to kind of predict the amount of energy that's available in an ecosystem. This is typically what you're looking at when you look at a lot of diagrams. But take note of what is being diagrammed in these pyramids, because if you are given one, let's say you're given a pyramid of numbers and you get something like this, you may think you may write in like an FRQ. Oh, that's not possible because there are too few producers not thinking the fact, oh wait, those producers may just be huge. Uh, a quick reminder that, um, you know, we have food webs and food chains to show how energy and matter move through an ecosystem. Um, when you're looking at uh, these interactions in reality, they're usually food webs uh, because organisms will have more than one source of energy just because, um, you know, it, it doesn't, pay to be too specialized if the environment's changing. All right. So let's take a look at something. Let's say we have this nice, happy ecosystem. It's getting a certain amount of sunlight coming into it. That supports a certain number of producers um, who support a certain number of primary consumers and a certain number of secondary consumers. Then unfortunately, bam, tragedy strikes. A volcano erupts somewhere. Maybe not in this ecosystem, but what happens is it throws up a cloud of ash and smoke into the air. What does that do? Well, that decreases the amount of sunlight that can get through. So notice, instead of this much plentiful sunlight, we now have much smaller piddly amounts of sunlight coming down, which decreases the base of our pyramid because less sunlight means less producers, and that decreases the size of our um, like primary consumer level because less producers can support less primary consumers and in some cases it can even eliminate the top levels of the food chain or of uh, the food web altogether because there's just not enough energy going up to that level to support anyone so a change in the resources the energy resources available to a trophic level or uh, to an ecosystem like for example the sunlight here can affect the number and the size of trophic levels um, you can also uh, have a change in the size of trophic levels if you, de if you change the uh, producer level. So let's say you had this lovely forest and instead of a volcano, a person came along and bulldozed and cut down a bunch of the trees. You decreased the, the population of producers, which means there's less energy to go up to our primary consumers. They're going to get less of it and there's going to be less energy so you may not even be able to support a tertiary consumer. Uh, autotrophs and heterotrophs are the guys that are helping energy flow through an ecosystem. So uh, the most absolute essential organisms, none of the rest of us can survive without them, are autotrophs. There are two major types of autotrophs. The one you tend to think of most are photosynthetic autotrophs or photoautotrophs. These are the guys that take sunlight and use it and carbon dioxide to basically start creating glucose and carbohydrates. However, there are some light independent ecosystems. Most of them seem to be like located like in deep underwater uh, in these oceanic vents where you have a lot of sulfuric acid and you know, various sulfur compounds coming out. Well, in those cases, some bacteria can perform chemosynthesis and they can use the chemical energy there to produce carbohydrates and, you know, make glucose and they support entire chains of ecosystems there. Uh, some of these can be aerobic, some of these can be anaerobic. So oxygen may not make that big a difference here. 
So what the autotrophs all produce is known as primary productivity. It's basically the rate at which autotrophs are producing glucose and other biological molecules. All the heterotrophs in an ecosystem who eat those autotrophs are dependent on this primary productivity. So if tomorrow all the plants disappeared suddenly, the rest of us would be in trouble. But if tomorrow everything except plants disappeared, those plants would be fine. Well, as long as they had, you know, some bacteria and fungi. Let's say all animals disappeared. The plants would be fine. If you look at this graph, it's showing you the productivity of various parts of the world. Um, you'll notice there are variations in productivity in the land. So, for example, here, you can probably guess what the land is like over there. There is very little productivity, which means it's a desert, probably. Which you know, if you know that, oh, okay, the Middle East is a desert and so is the northern part of Africa with the Sahara. You can also see that very clearly here in the center of Australia or here in the American Southwest. Now places with the highest productivity are places like forests. Uh, had a lot of forest up here. Um, and then up here you have the taiga which is boreal forest so those forests uh, forests tend to have high levels of productivity you can also chart the productivity in the ocean so any place where you have red is going to have a lot of chlorophyll notice the most productive areas actually are along coastlines and not far from the poles um, and there, your limiting factor isn't light. Your limiting factor is nutrients. So you've got these like dead zones in the open ocean where not a lot of things grow because not a lot of producers can grow there. So without a lot of producers, you don't have a lot of things living there. Uh, you may hear about or read about net or gross productivity. Um, if you, and you may hear about other things like net income and gross income. Um, your Net is your total after you, you take away anything you use. So for example, your net income would be how much you get paid after taxes, after they take everything out of your paycheck. Your net productivity is all of the, um, basically all of the carbon containing compounds that are made during respiration, all the energy that's made during respiration, minus whatever is used up. I mean, all the energy that's used made in photosynthesis, or, all the energy that's stored in photosynthesis minus the amount that's used during respiration. Gross productivity is your total. So the gross income that you report on taxes is going to be everything you, you earned before they took away taxes or anything else. The gross productivity of an ecosystem or a plant is how much of, uh, how much basically photosynthesis they're performing and how many organic compounds are they making. If you look at um, the net primary productivity of something, <clears throat> you'll see kind of this concept we call biomass. So what is biomass? It's the dry weight of an organism. That's what this thing right here is saying. You take out all the water from an organism. The stuff that's left would probably be very flammable. You could burn it and get energy from it. And um, you can use that to measure the amount of energy that's stored in that tissue. All biomass ultimately comes from carbon dioxide that's fixed during photosynthesis to make glucose. And then that gets changed around to form all your other carbon containing compounds. And that's your biomass. So the ultimate source of all the biomass in an ecosystem is photosynthesis. Heterotrophs are organisms that eat other organisms. They take in the carbon compounds by eating parts of other organisms and metabolize them, break them down into monomers so they can use them for their own purposes. And a blast from the past, they perform hydrolysis on these things. Remember, hydrolysis, you add in a water molecule, break it apart, and use it to break more complex biomolecules into smaller ones. So like this would be an individual monomer. And this would be a polymer. All right, that is the end. Next up is going to be population ecology. Make sure you know where your calculator is, the one you're going to use on the AP test. There's a little bit of